While I was working at Peace Bridges in Cambodia, my friend and colleague Moni once explained to me how terrifying it was to live through the Civil War and its aftermath. One of his descriptions particularly stuck in my heart. He said, it was cheaper to buy bullets than to buy rice. I spent a very busy weekend last week welcoming the Lunar New Year with my Buddhist community, and it was a great joy. We chanted and meditated. We packed emergency meal kits for a local shelter. We drank tea, shared delicious meals, sang maybe a little bit too much karaoke, gave and received New Year's dollars and oranges and red envelopes, bowed in gratitude, took group photos, cleaned up after ourselves more than once, and generally just celebrated the joy of sharing life together. I felt at home and I felt safe. And yet in the back of my mind, I was aware of the grieving communities in Monterey Park and Half Moon Bay, California. Then on Monday, two high school students were shot and killed at a charter school in Des Moines, Iowa, in an apparent feud between rival gangs. Three days, three shootings, three settings, a community dance center, a workplace, a school. As Stephen Collinson observed on Tuesday, Everyday life is a soft target. Anywhere can become the venue for the next preventable tragedy. Everywhere we go, whatever we are doing, there is this background sadness that we carry with us that in our society, bullets may not be cheaper than rice, but life sure seems to be cheaper than bullets. We're not even through the first month of 2023, and yet we have already had thousands of reminders of how violent, desperate, and afraid we feel living in this society. As of the morning of January 26, 2023, the Gun Violence Archive had already documented, documented 3,030 gun violence deaths in the first weeks of January, 1,300 due to homicide, accidents, and defensive uses, over 1,700 from suicide. We have already witnessed 40 deaths from mass shootings and six deaths from mass murders. 21 children, 11 years old or younger, have already died from gun violence alongside 102 teens. And again, these statistics are just from January 1st to 26th of this new year, 2023. We talk pretty frequently about gun violence because, unfortunately, we have to talk frequently about gun violence. When we experience violence on the scale, you can't go far without encountering it. The reminders are nearly constant, as are the justifications. And one of the criticisms I heard most often in response to my last reflection on gun violence, for example, was that I didn't talk enough about all the lives that guns had saved. To be honest, that's not a conversation I'm actually very interested in having. At the most, it seems to me that it is simply proving that we have managed to create a very dangerous, desperate society where we must be constantly hyper-vigilant, always aware that violence can break forth anywhere at any time. It would simply affirm that what has been apparent to those who have lived as part of a marginalized community or to those who have studied history or sociology or to those who have the courage and empathy to step into solidarity with those who suffer. Our society is not well. Gun violence is obviously a problem. But there might be one glimmer of truth in the terribly callous and ubiquitous response that people give in these moments saying guns don't kill people, people do. Because gun violence is a symptom of our collective dis-ease. It both perpetuates and is sustained by social no norms that have blossomed out of a history of shared trauma and violence. What is it about our society that so effectively waters the seeds of violence in us? In the case of the shooter at Monterey Park, a person who spoke daily with the man said, described it this way. He said his whole life was going down. He had no job. He sold his property, very few friends. I believe he, he had no close friends, no family, no kids, no job, no money. He was hopeless and desperate. 
And in Half Moon Bay, the San Mateo County Sheriff explained that there was nothing that would have raised us to have any concern with the shooter at this time prior to this incident. That this was just one of those times, the sheriff said, when someone snaps and kills innocent people. But the shooter had had at least some history of workplace violence. One situation even resulted in a restraining order that included a restriction from owning or buying a gun for a short period of time. But that was more than a decade ago. And so these things had been left simmering below the surface for 10 years. In the case of schools, we know what we need. The National Center on Safe, Supportive Learning Environments makes the connections clear. They put in their documents for students to learn they need to feel safe. It is essential that all students be able to attend schools that provide a safe environment where they can thrive and fully engage in their studies without the distraction and worry about physical safety concerns. And they list three main categories. Physical safety is essential for a safe and supportive learning environment in which students and staff can thrive. It's related to higher academic performance, fewer risky behaviors, and lower dropout rates. And second, they list risky behaviors such as acts of violence, imperil safety for students and staff, and undermine the teaching and learning climate. If you feel safe, you're more likely to stay in school and to have better academic achievements. And the converse is also true. If you don't feel safe, you're less likely to stay in school and less likely to have uh, academic achievements. And the third thing they list is physical safety is important for students' feelings of connection and belonging to school and their educational experience, that feeling of community. They write, students who are not fe fearful or worried about their safety feel more connected to their school and care more about their educational experience. These things are well understood, and they're supported by both research and pedagogical experience and wisdom. But all of us know the reality, what it is like for our children to go to school. The 2022 State of the School Safety Report, which is a project of the Safe and Sound Schools, reported that only 68% of students reported feeling safe at school. Before you get excited that that's a high number, that means that around a third of our children don't feel safe at school. A third of our children are being put at risk where they will not be able to feel connected, to feel passionate about their studies, to feel safe enough to learn. There are many more details to this experience and the entire study is important and well worth your time if you go and look it up to read it. However, for the moment, I want to simply bring attention to the public safety concerns that are included in that research. This, these are the things that the study was analyzing because they are daily stressors in our children's lives. Active shooter and attack, intruders and unauthorized visitors, bomb threats, bullying, cyberbullying, aggression, discrimination toward minorities and individual, either individuals or groups, sexual assault and abuse, substance abuse, gang activity and recruitment, youth trafficking, food insecurity, neglect and abuse, and homelessness. These are all real problems. And the report is very correct in addressing them in this study, but lurking behind the reality is, again, the question of why? Why in the world are these public safety concerns so commonplace that we need to address them like this. Meanwhile, three more communities have joined the already thousands of US communities in processing the trauma of a mass shooting and the heartbreak of losing loved ones. Everywhere we look, we see the indications that our society is very ill. As a nation, we, we hold space tending to these open wounds, these seemingly unending cycles of violence. And we're back to that question. What is it about our society that so effectively waters the seeds of violence in us? There's not just one answer, but over the years, we're gradually understanding ourselves and the conditions that make both violence and wholeness more likely. I want to focus in on one of those elements today. 
In 2003, Stephen Weinman was asking some very similar questions, resulting in a wonderfully helpful book titled Power Under, Trauma and Nonviolent Social Change. Reflecting on how Sandra Bloom and Michael Reichert described the U United States as a trauma-organized society in which people are routinely exposed to trauma-genetic uh, environments, Weinman pointed out that social justice movements, especially movements since the women's movement had begun to, to really unmask and expose childhood sexual abuse, have helped us to have more awareness and understanding of how violence causes tra trauma, both in the victims and in the uh, uh, perpetrators. Oppression, he wrote, is generically traumatizing. Racism, patriarchy, homophobia, and economic brutality all routinely violate people's integrity and repeatedly render people powerless in the face of overwhelming personal and institutional forces. The social experience of people of color gay people, women, workers, poor people, children, and disabled people is saturated with abuse, humiliation, violence, and negation of personal worth. Building on the insight that Aurora Levin's Morales offered that abuse is a local eruption of systemic oppression and oppression the accumulation of millions of small systematic abuses, Weinman pointed out that no one who lives in a society like this can emerge unscathed. He wrote, ours is a sickening society, a society in which toxic social conditions create psychological and physical illness by routinely traumatizing people. I've come to understand what he was talking about as a kind of generic oppression, where we learn from an early age to accommodate injustice this is just the way things are and there's nothing you can do about it. We internalize the notion that injustice and the trauma that goes with it is inevitable, if not natural. It's simply normal, the way that things are, even if you don't like it. And so we learn to consider it unsurprising, for example, that it's possible for a coworker, a friend, a family member to one day snap and murder others. That the notion of snapping in this way is a common concept, that should bewilder and shock us. It should not be an explanation. It should be understood as a symptom of our society's illness, an indication of our need for healing and change. Having an environment at home, school, work, or in the community where we both feel and are safe is a major component of social and personal well-being. It feels like this should go without saying, but our constant exposure to violence and our collective inability or unwillingness to do anything substantive about it makes it important to keep saying these things aloud. Take, for example, last Monday's school shooting in Iowa. Des Moines Police Sergeant Paul Parizic explained that these are supposed to be our safe spaces. In this school in particular, it's one that the police department works very closely with. The school is designed to pick up the slack and help kids who need the help the most, the ones who aren't getting the services they need for a variety of different reasons. To have it happen here, it's going to be a horrible impact on the community. And part of that horrible impact is, to return to Weinman's words, the way in which toxic social conditions create psychological and physical illness by routinely traumatizing people. This includes both acute stress, such as directly experiencing or witnessing a violent act, or the chronic stress of living with the anxiety that violence may always be a possibility lurking around the corner. These stressors undermine our well-being and limit our ability to thrive. The pressure accumulates in our lives. I have friends and acquaintances on both the right and the left who passionately believe the solution to these problems is for more people to have more guns. They've told me more than once, I've heard you, and they've often told me quite passionately of how naive I am to disagree with them. But I remain unconvinced, and not least because many of these same folks view the other 
as their enemy. Their guns are, at least in part, to protect themselves from each other. It appears much more likely to me that this faith in violence and the guns that both embody and symbolize the power of this violence to impose their will on others, that's what is naive. At the very most, violence is a short-term solution that, if left unhealed, creates more long-term problems. Even the protection that guns promise come at the expense of the threat of violence. That in itself is stressful. And, of course, it often comes with violent acts. We cannot heal ourselves with guns, but we can traumatize ourselves with gun violence. So many of our solutions focus on ramping up threats, stockpiling weapons, training more and more people to be prepared to use violence, and generally reinforcing our habits to reach for violent solutions. I understand this. I know why we do this. I understand that we've created a society where these things feel like the best options available and we don't have a choice. But I cannot see any way in which these are healthy long-term solutions. At the very least, I urge you to consider that these are short-term measures to help us deal with the constant crisis field emergencies that we've somehow come to accept as everyday life. At the very least, let's increase our support for developing and funding trauma healing for wounds that already exist and social programming for addressing the injustices that marginalize and traumatize people in the first place and reinforce those cycles of violence. This approach may be especially hopeful for all of us who belong to oppressed communities, and I felt torn between the hope for healthy, healing, whole life and world, and the helplessness mixed with an often overwhelming rage that simmers in our traumatic grief. As Weinman also noted, when we view trauma from a political perspective, two truths emerge with stand in stark tension with each other. That trauma can psychologically debilitate people in ways that help to perpetuate domination and oppression, and that trauma can help to spark personal and political resistance to domination and oppression. He wrote, I believe that it's critical to develop our understanding of both sides of this tension. It is in the push and pull between the ways that traumatized people are damaged and defeated by oppression and the ways that traumatized people stand up to oppression that our prospects for mobilizing effective social change movements rise or fall. As another day begins here in the United States, always potentially filled with violence, I choose again for my grief to spark personal and political resistance to domination and oppression. I dream of a day when my friends no longer feel the need to carry a gun when they go to the grocery store. I dream of a day when someone snapping and committing acts of violence is unheard of and bewildering. I dream of a day when we've learned to live together in such a way that no one has to depend on marginalizing, exploiting, or traumatizing another human being to try to meet their own needs. And I dream of, of a day when no one feels the need to harass me into buying a weapon because we've made it possible to live together with compassion and wisdom where everyone feels and is finally safe. Thank you. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.